is a CBS News special report. I'm Margaret Brennan in Washington. We're coming to you as a historic moment is about to happen in Selma, Alabama. The casket of longtime Congressman John Lewis, a lion of the civil rights movement, is at Brown Chapel AME Church and will soon travel across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. That site is where Lewis was beaten bloody by state troopers on what became known as Bloody Sunday in 1965 as he led civil rights demonstrations. Now, the televised violence that happened helped to build support for the 1965 Voting Rights Act, which helped dismantle Jim Crow era laws that disenfranchised black Americans. I want to go to CBS News anchor and national correspondent Michelle Miller in Selma, right near that bridge. Michelle, on that day, in March 1965, Lewis and those marching with him had no idea what they were about to face until they got about halfway across and they saw that wall of law enforcement and the troopers who would beat him bloody. Um, you knew him growing up and I wonder what you're thinking today. Thinking so much. I'm thinking of what he meant to uh, so many people. As I as I sit here at the base of this bridge, and I was trying to reflect, had I ever been here before? Because I've talked about it, I've seen it, but I've actually never been to Selma, Alabama, in my lifetime. And so the memories are so strong, not just for me, but for many of the people lining the street here, Broad Street, just to my left. Uh, rows of people, I'd say not the okay. crowds that you might expect, but yes. certainly the pandemic has, uh, has, has kept many people um, from coming out. Yeah. So uh, people Michelle, are excited I, I just to wanna, be here, but I, I don't to mean to cut you off, but I want to quickly point out to our viewers, we are going to listen in now to Congresswoman Terry Sewell. John Lewis was a mentor. I want to begin by thanking the Lewis family. Thank you so much for sharing John with the world. Thank you for accompanying John to Selma one last time. But even more importantly, thank you for sharing him over and over again. Our nation is better off because of John Robert Lewis. My life is better. Selma is better. This nation and this world are better because of John Robert Lewis. So thank you, family. Thank you to his dedicated staff. Thank you to all those who love John. John John's love was unique and all-encompassing. It was powerful. You felt it radiate. I miss him dearly, but we are so deeply blessed to have touched, been touched by his greatness. He will forever change Selma and this nation. On Bloody Sunday in 1965, John was confronted by Alabama state troopers and their dogs. They beat him with billy clubs, fracturing his skull. But John was determined to fight for equality and justice, putting his own life on the line in the service of others and a brighter future for everyone. John crossed bridges so many times, insisting that our nation live up to the ideals upon which it was founded. As he always said, he gave a little blood on that bridge. As always, John was humble. His humility rang true. As he takes his final march, that final crossing, John bridged the gaps that so often divided us, our political parties working every day for a more just and equitable America. My heart is full knowing that John is crossing that Selma Bridge today in his final march. His final march, that final crossing, so different from the first, speaks to the legacy that he leaves behind and the lives that he has changed. It's poetic justice that this time Alabama state troopers will see John to his safety. They will accompany him on his last trip over the Selma Bridge and on to Montgomery, where he will lie in state at the Capitol. John has left this earth, but his legacy remains on. And we continue to benefit from his life's work. He's laid out the blueprint for us to pick up the baton and continue his march for voting rights, 
for civil rights, for human rights. John believed firmly that the best days of our nation lie ahead of us. I hope his passing causes us to rededicate ourselves to getting into good trouble, necessary trouble. Can't you hear him? Never give up. Never give in. Keep the faith. Keep your eyes on the prize. For John and our nation, let's make him proud. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome gospel recording artist, Kristen Glover. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, and let me stand. I am tired. I am weak. And I, I am one through the storm and through, through the night. Lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, and lead me on when my way grows drear, precious Lord. God of our silent tears, thou who has brought us thus far on the way, thou who has by thy might led us into the light, keep us forever in thy path, we pray. Most gracious Father, we come before your presence this morning, reverencing you as our God, understanding that it is you who have made us and not we ourselves that we are the sheep of your pasture, and it is in you that we live, move, and have our being. We thank you for this day. We thank you for life and another opportunity to serve you this day and live out your purposes in the world. We thank you, Lord, for this occasion as we have assembled ourselves here to give thanks to you for a life well lived. Thank you for Congressman John Lewis. Thank you, Father, for his legacy, his legacy of being a freedom fighter, his legacy of being a foot soldier for justice. 
the legacy of being a servant of humanity as he walked humbly with you and as he always remembered his roots and always a strive or strive so that this world could be a better place, a more equitable world, a world that is more just and more righteous. Thank you for his service to humanity. Thank you, Lord, that he was willing to get in the way. Thank you that he was willing to stir good trouble. Thank you for his voice, the voice that will resonate in our hearts and minds for years and generations to come. Thank you for his message. Thank you, Lord, for using him for such a time as this to bridge divides and help us become a more perfect union. I pray this morning for his family. I pray, Lord, that you will comfort them as only you can, that you will undergird them with your strength and grant them your grace. I pray for your peace that surpasses all understanding to guard their hearts and their minds through Christ Jesus, our Lord. And Lord, I pray that we who are still remaining, who still have blood running warm in our veins, that we too will stand for justice, that we will stand for righteousness, that we will lift our voices for you, lift our voices for the cause that is just and right. Until we hear your welcome voice, say, well done, good and faithful servant. As Congressman Lewis crosses the Alabama River, we rejoice today knowing that he's already crossed the Jordan River and he's now resting in your presence. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray and ask all these things. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the structured program, but we just have a few notes that we need to give everyone. First and foremost, if we can just show some appreciation. You've been listening in to some prayers and memorial to Congressman John Lewis, who passed away at the age of 80. And all this week, his legacy, his life will be celebrated uh, in about six days of formal ceremony. You're watching what is happening in Selma, Alabama today. And uh, just to remind everyone, uh, as we heard the Speaker of the House refer to John Lewis. She called him the conscience of the Congress. She called him the titan of the civil rights movement. And that is why he is being given this uh, send off to remember where we are as a country. And I, I want to reflect on that um, with our colleagues today. Michelle Miller, uh, our CBS correspondent uh, and anchor who is on the scene there in Selma, I want to bring you into the conversation, Michelle, because what we know that we're waiting to see is a reenactment in some ways, that final crossing of what happened in 1965, that bloody Sunday uh, when John Lewis led marchers from that church where we were just looking, from the Brown Chapel, uh, where those marchers were organizing at the time to push, to repeal these Jim Crow era restrictions. Um, and he was ultimately successful. He went on to have a 33-year career in Congress. And we're celebrating his life, Michelle. But I wonder what it is like to be there on the ground at this moment. Well, I have to point out what you said, what you asked me earlier. And, and that is a, a, a level of context to his story. I mean, progress is his legacy. You think about what took place in 65. You think about them wanting their voting rights. They wanted to be enfranchised. Back then, Selma, the city of Selma, had a majority African-American population, and yet they were less than 5% of registered voters. And so this was a push to ensure not only the rights of all African-Americans in this nation, but let's just start here. Think about the fact that you have a black mayor here. You have a majority black city council here. And the congresswoman from the state of Alabama in this district, the first African-American woman to represent Alabama in the Congress 
came from Selma, Alabama. You think about all of those things, and you, all of those are a direct connection to Congressman John Lewis. So he means everything to the people who have lined the streets here along Broad Street. They are ready to watch this man being celebrated for that commitment to giving them what they did not have. And it was a, an effort that he always talked about, an effort of walking in his shoes to understand we may not be where we want to be, but we certainly are much better off than we were in 65. We know that chapel, that church, the first African Methodist Episcopal Church, Brown Chapel, is about 10 blocks from where you are, and that is where the procession will head. Um, I want to bring into the conversation our Bob Schieffer, who covered those historic moments. Um, and I know, Bob, you just five years ago walked across the Edmund Pettus Bridge alongside Lewis. Bob, what was that like? And, and I think we should remind our audience what the Pettus Bridge is named after, and that is a Confederate who was a senator and a Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan. The symbolism of that. Well, uh, that uh, uh, Martin Luther King knew that, and that was part of the reason that he picked the Pettus Bridge uh, to have this march. He wanted that to be a symbol of where they had come from and where they were going. And Margaret, we cannot overemphasize how important this march was. In 1965, Congress was very reluctant to pass a Voters' Rights Act. But after this march and the bloody uh, demonstration that happened there, after that, members of Congress and the American people uh, were so repulsed by what they had seen that in a matter of days, they passed the 1965 Civil Rights Act. And when that happened, it changed everything. It changed the South. It changed the country. When Barack Obama uh, was uh, inaugurated, he whispered into uh, John Lewis's ear, I'm here because of you. And he was right about that. You know, we talk a lot right now about the moment we're in, Bob, and the power of symbols. And the idea that Edmund Pettus's name is still on that bridge, and I'm looking at a picture of it now with rose petals strewn across it waiting for John Lewis to cross. And yet, it was John Lewis alongside the Congresswoman Terry Sewell, who we just heard from, who wrote in a piece uh, back in 2015, he didn't want it renamed. He didn't want his name on that. He said, you cannot rename that bridge any more than we can erase this nation's history of racial intolerance and gender bias. Changing the name of the bridge would compromise the historical integrity of the voting rights movement. He wanted us to remember it. He did. He told me that himself uh, when I walked across the bridge with him that day in, in uh, 2015. Uh, he wanted people to remember what had happened there and, and what was going on there. You know, John Lewis, it was, it, uh, Margaret, it was one of the most amazing experiences I've had in, in all the years that I, I have been here with, with CBS. To, to stand at the top of that bridge and to have John Lewis tell me, we didn't know what was going to happen when we got there. We knew there was going to be violence. And John Lewis went to his death not knowing how he got from the bridge to the church where he finally wound up that day. He was the first person hit. He went down, he was badly beaten, he lost all memory. He told me, I thought I had died on that bridge. Incredible, um, incredible, Bob. Um, I'm literally getting goosebumps as you're retelling me that story. Um, I wanna, uh, I know on standby is CBS's Jamel Bowie who has also been listening in and Jamel, um, you know, we were talking with Michelle about what this moment means and what the baton is that has been passed on to the next generation. And I think it is significant that we're not just talking about the passing of a civil rights icon, but what happens next. The last time the public saw John Lewis was standing in Black Lives Matter Plaza. Do you see this as the modern incarnation of what he was trying to do? 
I think so. I think the thing to remember about John Lewis, especially when he was with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in the early 60s, is that his, that group and his allies in that group were sort of on the far edge of the civil rights movement, meaning that they did the things that more establishment figures within the movement weren't necessarily willing to do. So the Freedom Rides, for example, well, we look back now and think of them as being sort of very much part of the entire process. At the time, uh, leaders like uh, uh, in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, other civil rights leaders were very apprehensive about the decision to hop on buses and go directly into the Jim Crow South. That Lewis was doing something that in some sense was not just transgressive for the segregated South, but transgressive within the sense of the entire movement. It was very dangerous. And so when we look at Black Lives Matter protesters today in doing things that are controversial, that um, aren't just controversial to their opponents, obviously, but within sort of civil rights movements, I think it's uh, I think it's worth thinking about Lewis as really much, really, very much occupying a similar space when he was a young man. And what we're looking at now um, for our viewers, you are seeing uh, a horse-drawn cart known as a caisson, uh, which will carry uh, the casket of John Lewis. It is being prepared now, as you can see. Um, and it is just that caisson that will cross the bridge uh, as we watch um, in just a few moments, as you can see, they are getting prepared to do just that. Um, and, and Jamel, while you were speaking, we were showing images of a young John Lewis, and he was quite young. On that march in Washington, on Washington he was just 23 years old. I mean, that's incredible uh, to think that he had such conviction at such a young age. Yes, I, I think that's something, the civil rights movement has so, it's so much part of our, I think, national narrative now that it's sometimes easy to forget what happened and what those people did. These were, many of them were very young people. They, you know, John Lewis was the son of Alabama sharecroppers. They came from those kinds of backgrounds. Uh, and they, with determination, with conviction, with faith, uh, transform not just the South, but the entire world. Uh, it's not for nothing, right, that at, a lo at the same time the civil rights movement was happening, we're also having the, um, the push against co uh, colonialism in Africa, in Southeast Asia. And those people as well look to the civil rights movement, look to people like John Lewis um, for inspiration and in, in fighting against uh, colonial powers and fighting against an apartheid in South Africa. Uh, this was an example for the entire world. I want to go now to Capitol Hill and CBS News congressional correspondent Nancy Cordes, who is standing by. Uh, Nancy Lewis served for 33 years in Congress. Um, how do his fellow lawmakers remember him? Well, you know, Margaret, it's interesting. For someone who cemented his place in history from the time he was 21 years old, what every lawmaker I've spoken to has said about him is that he had such humility. Uh, they say he's someone who understood the power of the spotlight and certainly used it when necessary, but that he didn't crave the spotlight. And then, in fact, he often shared it with others. Terry Sewell, who spoke this morning, talked about the fact that there was never a time when she was in the same room with him or at an event that he didn't point to her and bring her up and say, this is Terry. This is Terry from Selma. You have to meet her. And she talked about how much that meant to her as a young representative to have that stamp of approval. Um, the other thing that so many lawmakers have, have mentioned is just his determination. You know, 33 years that he was here in Congress, he went back to the Edmund Pettus Bridge every year on the anniversary to reenact that march across the bridge. He brought Democrats, he brought Republicans, he brought top journalists like Bob Schieffer because he wanted Congress and the country to remember what had happened there. He didn't think uh, that the achievements that he had gained were set in stone. He knew that there was more to be done and that bringing the public's attention back to that site year after year would help him to get that message across. He even went there when he was sick with cancer, managed to make it back to that spot to cross the bridge one more time. And it's such a great point. In the middle of a pandemic, 
put on a mask and came and stood in that square to make the point. Um, you were watching a picture now of a military honor guard carrying the flag-draped casket of Congressman Lewis. As you can see, in an acknowledgment of just where we are at this moment in our country, all of them are wearing masks. I think it is worth pointing out that that is also uh, something the family has acknowledged in asking those who want to pay respects not to travel, to acknowledge what is happening in our country right now. It is a local ordinance to wear a mask, of course, but it is also uh, very much a problem in the state of Alabama, what is happening with their infection rate right now. But still you have the crowd watching, and I want to listen in as they pay their respects. You are watching now the case on the cart and horse carrying the flag draped coffin of Congressman John Lewis as he begins for the final time the 10 block 
trek from uh, Brown Chapel to the Edmund Pettus Bridge. He is one final time going those same 10 blocks that he did on that day in March 1965 that became known as Bloody Sunday. And there in Selma is our Michelle Miller uh, who joins us now. And, and Michelle, you know, it is incredible the symbolism here, the military honor guard. Uh, and I know that Alabama state troopers will be there on the other side of that bridge as part of this procession, as part of this memory. And that's incredible to think that it was a group of Alabama state troopers who beat him bloody, as Bob was just telling us in 1965. He couldn't even remember what had happened. He thought he had died uh, because of the injuries he sustained that day. And yet today, it is Alabama state trooper, troopers who will be helping to memorialize him. It's incredible. Yes, and an honor guard taking him from the base of the bridge on the other side, being passed to that honor guard, and then moving forward on to Montgomery, where he will lie in state at the state capitol. I mean, it's the progress is incredible to think about. You know, as I was listening to you and Nancy, I, I keep going back to that point of humility. It made him so approachable. And as I walk through the streets or I talk to people, each one of them has a slice of history that they can talk about, specifically with John Lewis. I think about Cheyenne Webb Kreisberg, who was on this bridge as an eight-year-old with John Lewis and so many others, those 600 protesters. She had conviction like he, and she talked about him and what he gave her, this incredible courage, always reaching out always encouraging her, just like Nancy mentioned with Congressman Sewell. I think about what uh, Bob Schieffer had mentioned, not knowing uh, who brought him from, from the church to the hospital. In speaking to a few people, I was told that, in fact, some of his fellow protesters told the police officers that he was a veteran and so that they needed to get him to a hospital so that they could respect this man who had in fact uh, fought and, and we know he did not. Um, but you know he was meticulous with how he cherished his own legacy even to the trench coat that some of his helpers and handlers say they found inside his home kept meticulously that trench coat that he wore here on this bridge 55 years ago. So the man understood his place, but he still had a humble way about making sure that everyone knew that he was here for them. And I think it's interesting to look back at so many of the remarks he made and his emphasis throughout on nonviolence as the best pathway to make change. Um, and then the extension of that as a lawmaker. Uh, but always, Michelle, coming back to that message of causing good trouble. Good trouble. <laughs> good trouble. Uh, uh, good trouble is the name of the documentary that uh, Don Porter uh, sought out or has now produced and it just released shortly before he passed away. To the very end, uh, the congressman was hoping to promote it um, and yet had to bow out of, uh, of a conversation uh, that was supposed to be taking place. I mean, this man was on this bridge four months ago. Um, he was sick then and yet he met with protesters because this is a pilgrimage that meant so much to him and so much to the people of Selma. So he was here. And I'm told he was in pain. I'm told that uh, he uh, was having a hard time, but he made it here. It's that conviction that pulled him through and always the intention to move further. Progress so important to him. And Jamel Bowie, uh, our CBS News political analyst, uh, joins us uh, again. Jamel, I know you've been writing and reflecting on John Lewis and his legacy. And he's been called in some ways a founding father, certainly a founding father in terms of a more inclusive democratic America. And I wonder how you're thinking about that. I think that's the right way to think about him. We have to remember that 
for most of the 20th century, up until the 1960s, American democracy was still tightly limited. Um, the only people who could vote right up until the 1920s were white men. After that, after the passage of the 19th Amendment, uh, it became white men and white women. Uh, although African Americans who happened to live in the North uh, were able to cast ballots, they were never sort of the majority of African Americans, a large portion of African Americans. The majority of African Americans uh, still lived in the South uh, for, you know, up until the 1960s and 1970s. And they couldn't vote. They, they couldn't, it wasn't just that they couldn't vote, they had no real access to our democratic uh, institutions. And so the, the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, these things that John Lewis was very much a part of bringing to fruition really does end up extending American democracy in this fundamental way. You could even go as far as to say that we weren't fully democratic until 1965. And when looked at it in, that, in those terms, I think it is entirely appropriate to refer to John Lewis and other members of the civil rights movement as founding fathers um, in the same way that we would consider Jefferson or Washington or uh, Frederick Douglass, Lincoln, uh, in a previous generation. And we are standing by. We know the buses carrying family members of John Lewis will go to uh, the Capitol, go to Montgomery, while uh, John Lewis himself, as we've been telling you, we will bring you that coverage of when he does once again make that final crossing of Edmund Pettus Bridge. But as we reflect on his legacy, I, I do think it's important to have a reminder of what was happening at that time. And Bob Schieffer, you know, these days we talk so often about the painful moment our country is in. And you hear again and again, this is unprecedented. But the one point to which people compare us now is what was happening in that period of the late 60s, the amount of change, the amount of, of tumult. Where do you think we are now? Well, I'll be honest, Margaret, I wish I knew. We, we are in a very, very difficult time. And if there is anything good to, to say because of the passing of John Lewis, it is that it has given us a chance to think about who he was and what he stood for. You know, our politics is so awful now, Margaret, that our best and brightest don't want to run for office. How long has, you, has it been since you heard anyone say, I hope my child grows up to be president? My grandmother, like the grandmothers of my time, all thought their grandsons were going to grow up to be president. Uh, because that's that's the way it was. Now people don't want anything to do with politics, and mm. and we find, uh, you know, the Congress. There are still good people in the Congress, but in the Congress, so many people seem not to want to do anything controversial because they think they're going to get a primary opponent, and so so they do nothing. Think about what John Lewis did. John Lewis wasn't worried about who was on his side. He was worried about what his side stood for. He was not afraid. His philosophy was very, very simple. If there is something wrong and we see it, we are morally obligated to try to sue something about it. Uh, you know, I love being a journalist. And one of the reasons I love about it, it gave me the opportunity to, to meet some of these remarkable people. The two great genuine heroes that I came to know during my time at CBS News were very different in some ways, but very much alike in others. John McCain and John Lewis. They were men of great courage who were in politics because they thought it was a place they could make America better, and both of them did. Bob, um, I think you, you brought us to where we are um, very eloquently there um, in, in terms of trying to use his office to change this country for the better. Um, I want to talk to, to Nancy Cordes about that. Nancy, you're on Capitol Hill. I know, and, and, and just in reading up on Lewis, since his passing, it stood out to me, because of the moment we're in, how he had been a champion of underscoring health disparities 
particularly among brown and black Americans. That was one of the things he championed, needed, needed to be paid more attention to at a moment when we are seeing that drawn into stark relief with how this pandemic is ravaging our country. Um, he also worked on the trying to establish that African American uh, museum here in Washington. But what, as a lawmaker, do you see as his legacy that he was able to enshrine? Well, I think he fought for uh, rights for all kinds of people. As you mentioned, uh, he fought very hard for health care, for the right of every American to have health insurance. He fought for gay rights. He fought for immigration reform. And just picking up on what Bob was just talking about, he had this courage and conviction that en enabled him to sort of lend moral clarity to any debate that he was in. As Hank Johnson, his uh, congressional colleague from Georgia put it, when John spoke, it was like the voice of God coming down from heaven. So he lent a gravity uh, and a sense of um, you know, a, a clearness of purpose to every policy discussion that he was having. And I think it's important to remember, as we see that case on beginning to go over the bridge, that by the time he stood on that bridge for the first time in 1965, he had already been beaten multiple times as a freedom rider. He, he was no stranger to being arrested and being beaten. And in fact, uh, civil rights leaders chose that bridge to make this march because they knew that the local sheriff had a history of encouraging violence against African Americans and civil rights fighters. And so they knew that this would be a very stark contrast between their nonviolent approach and the approach that they were likely to meet from this sheriff and from his troopers. And so while, yes, on one hand, it's true that he didn't know what he would encounter when he got across the bridge, he knew it wasn't going to be good, and he still did it. And I think that, that courage uh, that he showed on that day was a real inspiration for uh, his colleagues here on Capitol Hill, in particular, his African-American colleagues, many of whom have told me that they believe that they would not be here today serving in Congress if it wasn't for uh, the, the heroic action that John Lewis and his allies took on the bridge back in 1965 that led to the Voting Rights Act. And you're right, it was 40 arrests, 40 arrests that he had gone through. Um, and, and Bloody Sunday just came to encapsulate things because of the idea it did build up public support, as Bob was describing, public horror at the televised images of what happened. And Nancy, I, I know now there have been even calls to reform the Voting Rights Act as some sort of memorial to John Lewis. What will be the memorial to John Lewis? Well, Democrats and his key allies say uh, the best way to honor John Lewis is not just by renaming the bill that uh, passed the House several months ago uh, in his name, but also by passing it in the U.S. Senate. Uh, one of the things that really uh, concerned Lewis and that he really fought for until the end was his feeling that the Voting Rights Act had been gutted by the Supreme Court a few years ago and that a lot of the protections that he had fought for had been rolled back by states. And so uh, Democrats kind of went back to the drawing board. They wrote a bill that they felt would provide those protections in a new form. It passed the House, but it hasn't gone anywhere in the U.S. Senate. And so uh, all, all the lawmakers that I've spoken to who were instrumental in putting that bill together have said that the best way to honor his legacy is not to rename the bill, it's not to rename the bridge, it's to pass the bill and to restore some of these protections that have made it possible for African Americans and others to vote for decades. Unfinished business, and as we heard Speaker Pelosi, uh, she called him, as you are saying, the conscience of the Congress. Um, and we are waiting to see this final crossing. Um, but I want to go to Selma again um, and Michelle Miller. Michelle, I know it is uh, hard to see from, from where you are because of the design of the bridge. Um, but can you just describe to us what you're seeing on the ground? I know the pandemic has put some restrictions on what is possible. But, but what is happening in Selma today? Well, you know, there are barricades here, but there are 
three to four people deep along Broad Street as they await the case on with uh, the body of John Lewis, the congressman, to, to, to approach the bridge. You see people uh, standing somberly. You see people uh, singing gospel hymns. You see people sharing stories. It, it, it truly is um, a, a wonderful uh, sight to behold because many of these people, some from Selma, uh, some from around the state of Alabama, but some from places as far away as California and New York have come here despite those warnings or cautions about the pandemic. They are masked. They are uh, not socially dis distancing along this route, but they certainly um, have a conviction. We're talking about conviction so often in, in this, this special report, but they were determined to be here. People who are part of the Black Lives Matter movement, people who were neighbors and friends, some who marched on that bridge with him. Um, so this is uh, something that they feel as though they need to do. They need to say goodbye to their fellow activists, to their congressmen in, in heart, um, and to the man they say they owe their ability to exercise uh, their rights as full citizens of this nation. And we know that this is about six days of um, events that are planned to remember John Lewis, uh, that he will go lie in state in the Capitol in Alabama, and then he will go to Washington, come here, uh, as Speaker Pelosi uh, explained earlier on this program, to lie in state. Uh, but we'll do so, again, because of the restrictions all of us are under due to this pandemic in an outdoor capacity so that people can come and safely, or as close to safe as we get these days, pay their respects uh, before returning to his beloved Georgia for his burial. Um, and in, in remembering this today, uh, I think it is incredible as we await these images, but just to see a military honor guard with that flag draped coffin, the symbols uh, of our democracy, the reminder that there are some things that persist, even the most um, strained times that we are under right now. And that in the middle of this, people still wanted to come out, Michelle, and pay their respects. Yes, as I said, it's, um, it's chilling. I'm getting goosebumps now as I think that this nation is honoring a, a member and an activist from 55 years ago. This man, had, he meant so much then and still does. I think of the longevity of his career and his activism and certainly his determination to when falling down, getting back up. It's such a symbolic gesture and it's such something we should be living by that there are there are things you are not going to succeed at. And yet you just pick yourself up and move forward. And he did this over and over and over again. Such an example for, for us in life and as he is um, now uh, giving us an opportunity to share stories and share histories uh, in his passing. And we're looking at that live picture there in Selma of the case on the horse-drawn cart bringing the casket and you see behind it the hearse. Uh, so you will see the transfer happen soon and then he will be brought just by just on that cart, um, no others joining to cross the bridge that final time. Um, you know, Bob Schieffer, when John Lewis gave, I, I believe, his final interview or one of his final interviews, it was to our colleague Gail King um, on CBS this morning, and he talked about the protests, the Black Lives Matter protests, the racial injustice protests that have been happening over the past few months, and he talked about the fact that it made him happy to see how diverse the crowds were, how widespread support was, uh, that for him, in so many ways, he was characterizing himself as someone who was about human rights, uh, about any way that could be defined, not just enshrined in that moment in 1965, but he saw it as a continuous movement in many, many ways.
You know, he did think of the uh, Black My Lives movement as an extension of the uh, of the uh, struggle that he had been so much a part of. But I want to I want to underline one thing, uh, Margaret, that we haven't talked all that much about. We've touched on it today. He was a an advocate of nonviolence. Mm -hmm. John uh, John Lewis never even threw a rock at anybody. He never, he never pushed back. He thought because Martin Luther King had taught him that the power in their movement would be the nonviolent act. And when they went through the training for uh, the lunch sit-ins and they asked, how do, we, how do we just sit at these counters and let people hit on us and beat us and slap us? And, and the trainer told them, uh, I saw this film some years ago, the trainer told them, sometimes if somebody hits you in the face, keep the eye contact. It will make them think about that. John Lewis was, it's just remarkable that he was not killed somewhere along the way. I mean, he was beaten at one point during the uh, Freedom Rides. He was left unconscious in a pool of blood in a bus station. Uh, he was hurt during those uh, those riots. I mean, those those sit-ins in Nashville, where he he took a major role in that. And then along the way, and then of course this thing. And here we are. We're coming now. We see the case on Margaret coming to the bridge. He'll he'll be on the bridge in just a matter of minutes here. He will indeed. And as you point out, it was a concussion and a fractured skull that he suffered that March day in 1965. And yet, despite those injuries. He still went on just some two weeks later to continue the march from Selma to Montgomery. Um, and in this route that we are watching, it, it's also worth pointing out here, this is the same route. This decision was made to follow that same route that they did back in 1965 from Martin Luther King Boulevard to Alabama Avenue to Broad Street and just over that bridge. Um, and as you can see there, as Michelle is describing for us, there are crowds. Some we can see wearing masks. I'm told some people there wearing T-shirts that said, good trouble. As Michelle was reminding us, that was how Lewis described uh, sort of his advice to young people to continue to agitate for change. Um, and as we await uh, the ceremony to begin, which I believe will be starting soon, um, Bob, I, I know when you made that walk across the bridge uh, with John Lewis just five years ago, that must have been incredibly powerful for you. Well, it was. I, I've never experienced anything quite like it, and I, I've covered a couple of stories in my time. This is not <laughs> the first time that uh, I, I was involved in a, in a big story. But just to be with him, and I'd spent a lot of time with him uh, before we uh, went across the bridge. Uh, and and this man was so humble. We've talked about this before. And, you know, he was humble even though he was one of the most, I think, one of the most famous people uh, in America. I mean, John Lewis couldn't walk from his office on Capitol Hill over to the Capitol building without 10 or 15 people stopping him along the way. I mean, I've never seen anyone that had the kind of name recognition that he mm -hmm. did. You know, Elijah Cummings was often mistaken for John Lewis. And he said he got to the point when he was in airports that sometimes people would come yeah. up and be a large group and he didn't want to embarrass the guy who said John Lewis, and so he just told him that's who he was. Bob, <laughs> Bob, I just want to allow our viewers to take this in as yeah. the casket begins crossing Edmund Pettus Bridge.
That is the casket of Congressman John Lewis as you were watching a very solemn final passage across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. You may have noticed a pause there midway through and it wasn't until in 1965 on that March day that the marchers were halfway at that halfway point on the bridge that they saw and anticipated the wall of law enforcement that was about to meet them with force. John Lewis that day suffering a cracked skull, a concussion. And today, Alabama state troopers will be part of paying homage to him. They will come to that casket uh, and they will help to load it into the hearse uh, as the nation continues this period of mourning for the civil rights icon and a public servant for more than 30 years. As you can see, that very uh, traditional passage horse-drawn carriage, the case on there, passing through the crowds on the other side of the bridge where that violence happened that day in March, helping to propel public opinion and public support for the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Michelle Miller is in Selma for us today. Um, Michelle, a fitting tribute, but I don't know how you quite can encapsulate such a life. It is a poignant image to see. Uh, it harkens back to what we saw uh, at the passing of Martin Luther King Jr. and a horse-drawn caisson carrying his body in much the same way. Before the casket and the caisson actually got to the bridge, I'm, I'm close to on the other side, what was so incredible to hear was an eruption of that song. I believe it was this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. You think about the words to that and what he was able to do in creating a movement and certainly the progress. And as it passed on its way up the incline to the bridge, people started shouting out, good trouble, good trouble, good trouble. 
And then the family joined halfway up. And at that point, they are in t-shirts that say, good trouble. Uh, I think about the weather. It has been raining and storming, and it has been uh, cloudy, thunderstorms throughout this area over the last several days. And look at it now. It's as if the heavens opened up to say, we rejoice and, and we recognize. Uh, it, poignant scenes um, from this side of the bridge as the family escort uh, the case on now into the hands of what we believe are the state troopers. It's a bit difficult for me to see. I'll let you pick it up from there, Margaret. You know, you're right, Michelle. I think this is um, the closest image we will get to see of the transfer, but as uh, our viewers may be noticing as they are shot from behind, those that appears to be the same military honor guard uh, that has arrived to be part of this um, transfer from the caisson of the casket uh, to the hearse. And uh, as Michelle was describing there, you may have seen those individuals step forward halfway across the bridge wearing black t-shirts saying good trouble. And we believe those are um, Congressman Lewis's family members who just dispersed but walked across halfway with him, including his son, John Miles Lewis. Um, let's take a pause here. It may be hard for our viewers to make out what is happening here, given the crowds and the photographers that are crowding in, but you can just sort of barely make out one of the hands. Uh, if we pulled out a little wider, uh, you would see that there are Alabama state troopers on the sides of that caisson, of that casket, who are saluting. Um, and that, that was a choice that is a statement, certainly, given that there were Alabama state troopers back in 1965 who beat those marchers, those civil rights marchers that John Lewis led in that procession that day from Brown Chapel across Edmund Pettus Bridge to where we are watching him now on this final crossing with that military honor guard now moving his casket, his flag draped, draped coffin into the hearse. That hearse will escort his body to the Montgomery capital of Alabama, where he will lie in state there.
It's right over my head. And as you can see, uh, the casket of John Lewis, having been loaded into the hearse, the doors now closing, John Lewis, one of Martin Luther King's top lieutenants, a civil rights icon, public servant to this country in the United States Congress for more than 30 years. And he will be remembered throughout this week. Here on CBS News, here across the country, uh, he will go now to the Alabama Capitol, lie in state there, then come to Washington, and finally, later this week, will be laid to rest in his home state of Georgia. And we are going to leave you all with these final images. I want to thank our viewers for watching us on this historic moment. Thank you for watching the CBS News Special Report. For news 24 hours a day, go to cbsnews.com.